but it is time now to have a look at the big stories of the week. And joining me from Bondi Partners, former Howard Government Minister Peter McGowan. Peter, how are you? Excellent, Tim. Great well, to be with the you. The battle lines on The Voice very much drawn now between Peter Dutton's opposition and the government. Correct. We, we, we know what the play will be from now on. Um, it's going to be about, on the one hand, an argument that constitutional recognition is well overdue. This is what First Nations have sought. Um, this will give them serious uh, determination of their own future. And on the other hand, the argument from Peter Dutton, the Liberals, and a number of Indigenous leaders is that this is excessive influence because it will report and advise and consult with the executive of government as well as the parliament. The courts will be called in to interpret. You're handing over so much of our future government to the courts. So they're the arguments. A lot of politics at play here. Of course, people have accused Peter Dutton saying, oh, the chess pieces came out after what happened at Aston. But there's a lot at stake for both leaders on this one because they're both taken such very clear positions. Correct. But you ha you'd have to concede, Tim, there's more at stake for Peter Dutton than there is Albanese. In the in unlikely event, in my opinion, that the voice is not carried as a constitutional amendment, uh, then Albanese will have been seen to have done everything within his power. On the other hand, if the, if, if the voice does prevail, as again, as I believe on current indications at will, Peter Dutton could be seen as a spoiler. So a lot will depend on how he conducts the argument, how Dutton uh, frames his points of view so as not to cause lasting enmity. Yeah, and look, he already has massive problems with the party, of course, the Liberal Party, trying to work out who they are at the moment. But do you think there'll be more Liberal moderates that uh, break away and we see more fracturing? No, Tim. If they haven't gone already from the shadow cabinet, then what would cause them to resign in the weeks ahead? So you've lost Julian Lisa, low public profile, not regarded as a, a significant party uh, player. Um, Simon Birmingham, the, the leader of the opposition in the Senate, is the one to watch. He's sitting on the fence. He's saying he, he won't campaign for The Voice. He won't campaign against it in favour of the Liberal Party position. That's untenable. That will be aggravating his candidates, uh, his colleagues. But apart from Simon Birmingham, I don't think there are any significant names yet to go from... Uh, will go from the Shadow Cabinet. The thing to watch, though, is how emotional do those backbenchers who've been given a licence to support the voice uh, attack their own side? I know it's a difficult crystal ball to look at and we're a fair way out from a federal election, but do you think Peter Dutton will be there? Definitely. He is highly regarded within the Liberal Party, uh, both for his personal and professional attributes. And, and he's done a remarkable job, Tim, to keep the Liberal Party as united on the voice as it is to date. Mm, OK. Now, the build-up to the budget, Jim Chalmers, very much setting the scene and setting expectation. Yeah, this, this is depressing. Um, as, a, as a Liberal, um, I, I, I cannot... Uh, condone what Prime Minister Morrison and Treasurer Frydenberg did during COVID and post-COVID. They just spent, racked up the government debt, blew out the budget, uh, surp blew away any chance of a surplus, ran the budget into deficit, and now Labor's continuing. It's not, an, it's not a reformist government. Um, the debate is that the increased taxation revenue from those people now in employment, reduced unemployment benefits gas, coal and iron ore receipts through the roof. They're probably going to get more than $40 billion in extra revenue. That should be used to try to balance the budget, not retire debt. That's almost an impossibility mm. as things currently stand. He's not even considering that. I have some sympathy for him. He has a lot of pressures for spending. Defence, aged care, NDIS, increased wages to public servants. Now, a lot of that they've brought on themselves by making campaign promises and doubling down since the election. But for, for, for those of us who believe in fiscal discipline and eventual retirement of debt, it's, it's a very depressing notion. Oh, it's an interesting time, isn't it? Because uh, lots of this country, from an individual perspective, middle Australia, aching. Like, I read a report this morning about some of the building companies, small businesses in Melbourne, building businesses that are just going to the wall. Yeah, I just don't think there's enough reward for effort. Uh, innovation is being stifled. Um, there's no, we're not addressing productivity. Economic 
reform and economic liberalism is off the agenda in this country, Tim. No one's debating it. We have to celebrate. We have to celebrate people's ingenuity and in the work that they do. Now, Donald Trump. Look, look, it almost makes me laugh when I look at it. I shouldn't. I know we're talking about one of the, the you know, the most powerful country in the world. But he's been charged. But he doesn't care. He just. It's like mm. it's hardly like not even bothering him. He's just charging towards. 2024 in his mind. Yes, and he's raising tens of millions of dollars, mm. 18 million by the looks already, for his legal fund. So it's the, the, the best lawyers in the country are not going to cost him personally, thanks to his supporters. I think it guarantees him the Republican nomination. Uh, so Ron DeSantis, Mike Pence uh, and the others, I'm sorry, I don't think they're going to get... Um, the nomination, but he has no chance, whatever. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? It's yeah. so bad for the Republican Party because he will get it, but he won't win the election. No chance. I'd, I'd stake my life on it. Yeah. Well, don't do that. We, <laughs> please don't do that. This is politics. Now, Joe Biden, uh, County Mayo in Ireland. When I look at the pictures, I wish I was there having a Guinness in one of the pubs. It's a great spot. It's been an interesting trip for him. True, but it's a Complete self-indulgence, Tim. Complete. There is not a single economic or security reason for him to be in Ireland. Mm. Now, he's an 80-year-old. 80, 80 they're rationing his, over, his transatlantic and, and far-flung travel, understandably. So he's not going to go to the king's coronation. Britain is an ally. It's not a partner or a friend. It is an ally. He's not going to the coronation on the 7th of May, but he's off to Ireland. The real reason is, firstly, it means a lot to him. Uh, one set of his grandparents were Irish, and the Irish lobby is the strongest in the Congress. And the, the Irish effect on the cultural, economic and political life in America is the strongest of any ethnic or cultural background. So he, he's following in the path of Clinton, Reagan, Kennedy, but I'm sorry, this is a waste of an overseas trip. Finally, um, let's change the pace. Uh, final day of, of the Sydney Racing, or the New South Wales Racing Carnival, Sydney Racing Carnival at Royal Randwick. This is a brilliant race, it's all age stakes. Yes, I mean, we're going to see some of the Everest runners in this. Uh, correct, and you listed the, the major contenders, except for Cascadian, mm. the Godolphin horse, but the best one, Giga Kick. Giga Kick, Giga Kick. you didn't mention Giga Kick. I, to, I, can't, I can't mention it all, I knew I was going to mention this, I need to give you some Broadway. So, the, yeah, thank you, you left a couple for me. So there's yeah. six, six top line sprinters, yeah. any of which could win. Yeah, and Giga Kick will start favourite, but I do like Marzu. Marzu and Lost and Running both out to the 1400 for the first time. We'll do it all again next week. Thanks, Tim.